I'm Naomi Clark, uh, one of the faculty here at the NYU Game Center, and it's my pleasure to be introducing the next talk, um, by way of which I'll say, uh, here at the Game Center, we have for a long time uh, taught non-digital design as a foundation for uh, students to go into developing tabletop games, but also doing digital game development and all sorts of other things. And that's in part because we see non-digital design as a great way to be able to prototype and jam quickly and do a lot of iteration, but of course there are also very interesting things that you can do in non-digital spaces where people are face-to-face -face, uh, that digital games have only begun to explore, right? Those kinds of social interactions that happen in a group, the negotiation that can happen in a role-playing game between a game master and players, uh, the emergent and collaborative storytelling that happens in those types of spaces as well. Uh, and for me, uh, there's actually no speaker or thinker who's more inspirational with, with regards to that stuff than uh, Avery Alder, who you're about to hear. Back in uh, 2013, uh, I saw a video of a talk uh, that Avery gave with Jolie St. Patrick at the Queerness in Games conference. Uh, it was called uh, Queering Tabletop Game Mechanics, and it was one of the first talks that I was aware of that really took the idea of uh, queer theory and uh, the practice of queering uh, and applied it to game mechanics. So talking about queerness not just as a matter of representation or of queer creators working in the field of games, but really thinking about how can we actually evolve or question or look at the underpinnings of what drives game mechanics and gameplay and uh, use that practice of queering to sort of twist and, and crack open the design space more, look at what's not being done, question the assumptions that have been sticking around in role-playing game spaces going all the way back to Dungeons and & Dragons. So it was actually that talk uh, that brought, um, that took, drew my attention to the field of what some people call indie role-playing games. It's been going on, uh, especially online, since the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, and that space has been continuously adapting and changing and exploring the space of tabletop role-playing games, sort of far afield from the traditions of Dungeons and & Dragons. And there's been a, a tremendous amount of exciting development uh, and new ways of thinking about game design that have also started to infiltrate the tabletop space. And of the indie RPG designers, uh, I find Avery's work particularly unique in how she thinks about forging human connections, telling new different types of stories, looking at outcomes and community and interpersonal relationships in all sorts of new ways. Uh, and so she's going to tell you a little bit about her work in that department. Um, but I'll close by saying that one of the games, the games that she's uh, about to talk about, Dream Askew, was actually the first game that I ever played with my wife. It was very uh, instrumental in bringing us together, so I owe a deep personal debt of gratitude to this particular game design you're gonna hear about. Uh, without further ado, give it up for Avery Alder. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. Uh, like Naomi just said, my name's Avery. Before I jumped into my talk, I just wanna get a sense of the audience that I'm speaking to. So just by show of hands, who here has played tabletop role-playing games before? Um, and then, uh, who here has played uh, independently produced tabletop role-playing games? Awesome, great. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about my most recent project, which is called Dream Askew. But specifically, I'm going to be looking at the ways that this game was informed by other games that came before it and other design trends that came before it and how it has gone on to inspire and uh, be co-developed with another game, a game called Dream Apart. Um, so. Uh, to set up a bit of context for that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my past work as a designer. So I do tabletop uh, role-playing games, and I'm going to talk about three games that I've designed in the past. The first is called Monster Hearts. So Monster Hearts is set in high school, and it's about teenagers who are having to contend with uh, uh, drama, power struggles, confusion, burgeoning sexuality, and all of this is examined through this, this lens or this metaphor of having a secret shame that you are secretly a monster. That in addition to all the other teenage drama you're facing, you're also a werewolf. Uh, you're also a vampire. Um, and that, that is both a literal thing that is true uh, about who you've become, but it also serves as a metaphor and a way of, of getting at uh, what it feels like to be a teenager generally. The next of the three games I wanted to talk briefly about is The Quiet Year, which is not exactly a role-playing game. So it's a game where you play as a community that has survived the collapse of civilization, that has fended off its most immediate threats, and that has 
a quiet year of relative peace with which to try and rebuild, try to ask questions about what it's going to mean to be part of this community and to look towards the future. Uh, instead of playing individual characters, we kind of, as players, take turns steering the community, making decisions kind of as the community or as trends or currents or factions within the community. Uh, what I really like about The Quiet Year is that, um, so it's a turn-based game, and on your turn you interpret a card and you make a decision, is the community going to be discovering something new, holding a discussion, or starting a new project? And there's a lot of restraint in terms of who can, or who can make those decisions and who can say what, when. Um, but the play of the game and the mechanical choices that you make on your turn kind of constitute this meta-conversation that's implicitly going on in the background of the game about uh, what each player thinks it means to belong to a community. So those two were tabletop role-playing games, and this is another game that I've designed. It's a pervasive game, which is to say a solo live-action role-playing game that you play in the back of your head amidst your everyday life as you, you, you know, walk down the street and as you're supposed to be working at your job, things like that. And so Brave Sparrow is a game about the fact that you're not human, never were, in fact, are a sparrow, um, and uh, the way that you play the game is that you, um, throughout your life, whenever you notice feathers, stop, inspect them, pick them up, and contemplate them and ask, is this one of mine? And if you think it is, collect it. Um, in addition to collecting feathers, you're tasked with witnessing moments of quiet beauty and acting with bravery in your daily life. All of this culminates in sparrow missions, which I can't talk to you about because you're not initiated into the sparrow. <laughs> family, um, but in, in short, Brave Sparrow is uh, an engine by which to develop grace and a sense of self. So these three games kind of constitute a bit of a, a survey of the, the work that I do. I tend to make games that are about queerness, apocalypse, community, relationships, self-doubt, and self-discovery. <clears throat> My most recent project is called Dream Askew. Um, and it was on Kickstarter up until Sunday. Um, so it, the Kickstarter just wrapped up. Dream Askew is about being a member of a queer enclave, a community that has fallen out of civilization. So this is a post-apocalyptic game, but rather than being a game that is about being a rugged individualist with a gun in the, near, like in the far future wasteland, it's a post-apocalyptic game that is contemporary, that is human, and that is relationship-oriented that positions the idea of apocalypse as a recurring calamity that hits marginalized people and that pulls marginalized people out of the promise of society. Um, I'm excited about talking not about Dream Askew itself so much today as um, the process of having Dream Askew come from other games and in turn inspire other games moving forward. Um, uh, one of those key games is Apocalypse World, um, a indie RPG put out by Vincent McGay Baker initially in 2010. Um, so again, so I understand my audience I'm speaking to, by show of hands, who here has read or played Apocalypse World specifically? Cool, uh, maybe 10 people, awesome. Um, so I'm gonna talk about Apocalypse World, but in order to contextualize that, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, major design trends in the indie RPG design landscape prior to the arrival of Apocalypse World. So this is what uh, indie RPGs um, were frequently and pervasively doing in terms of their, their design. Um, from around 2004 to the 2009, the era that I started designing role-playing games. So I've identified kind of five common design trends from that period. And design trends are always moving in multiple directions, self-contradictory, cyclical. Um, uh, it's impossible to say anything definitive, so don't, please don't take this as a definitive list, but these are things that we saw recurring in dozens and dozens of designs around that time. Um, rather than designing rules that were going to resolve the individual tasks or actions that characters were doing, designers are really excited about this idea of conflict resolution. That what we would do is we would have mechanics that took into account the intent of every character, what was at stake, what every possible outcome of a role could, could lead to. And they, they designed mechanics which often would have a scene point towards a, like a culminatory conflict resolution role. Um, so 
So we saw scene-based conflict resolution and pre-negotiated stakes. Um, because that, that big climactic conflict resolution role was such a focal point of scenes and of the game in general, we often saw dice mechanics that, uh, that took up a lot of space and that were really interactive and dynamic and attempted to be really complex and have nuance and strategy and often were small mini games. Like you would play three rounds of liar's dice and in between them you would uh, bid your traits and they'd be at risk or there'd be an anger die and a fury die and a temptation die and you can invoke them at different key stages. Uh, elaborate things like that. And that was really exciting in some ways because it meant that you had nuance and depth to conflicts and outcomes. Um, it also meant that you had to play a lot of dice mini games if you were into these kinds of role-playing games. Um, in order to move away from uh, uh, past design, which had you know, rules for swimming, rules for drowning, rules for grappling, and kind of like you know, a 300-page book of every possible eventuality within this game world, um, there was a common design trend of, of just saying, you know what, everything will just be a trait. And you just invoke a trait, it gives you plus two. It doesn't matter if your trait is your greatsword, your motorbike, the fact that you are the god of fire and brimstone, just whatever, plus two. Um, and finally, leading from the, the conflict resolution and bespoke die mechanics and things like that, there are often mechanics called endgame mechanics. And there'd be a certain fictional or usually mechanical trigger um, that would say, okay, now we are, we are switching to these new scene rules uh, that regulate the climax and third act of the story. Um, so, you know, once you've gained five fear, or once you've defeated the Baron three times in, in front of his, his populace, then you enter endgame. Um, so all of this, um, basically, uh, what a lot of games looked like in this period, again, like 2004 to 2009, if I was to roughly put a label on it, was that uh, the rules that we were designing were procedural frameworks for telling a particular type of story. They did a really great job of um, creating stories that had, like, predictable uh, story beats and where the outcomes of conflicts mattered. They also had some places where they were really lacking. The individual specific fiction didn't often matter. The mechanics still worked the same way no matter what content you were plugging into it. Apocalypse World came around and uh, kind of reversed a lot of those design trends. Uh, Apocalypse World positioned the act of role playing as a conversation. We're just talking. We're just saying what happens next in the story. We're leading from the fiction. And then when we're doing that, eventually, one of us will trigger something that's like, oh, that's a move. The rules have to kick in now. Uh, we've, we've been steering the story in this direction, and we've triggered the rules, and now the rules are potentially going to point us in a totally different direction. So we saw role-playing as a conversation. It was fiction first, uh, situational moves became triggered and, and, and kind of jumped up. And I've got an example of one here. Um, so this is one of the basic moves that every character had access to. Um, when you read a person in a, in a charged interaction, so maybe your character has uh, come in from the, the wasteland and they're in the, the one remaining speakeasy after the apocalypse and they see this stranger in the corner and they're kind of you know, scuttling around the edge of the place, eyeing this person up. Someone might say, it sounds like you're reading a person. And if you agreed, you'd roll dice and we'd go from there. Um, so all the mechanics um, responded to things that were specific triggers that were in the fiction. Um, Apocalypse World um, uh, moved away from the idea of bespoke, intricate dice mechanics with lots of substeps. Um, it kind of uh, seemed a lot more familiar to people who'd been playing kind of traditional task-based resolution type games. You rolled two dice and added a stat. What was interesting and unique about Apocalypse World's mechanics, maybe not unique, but what was interesting about it was um, that it, it had this range of partial success. If your result came up as a seven to nine, uh, this would mean that you were forced to make a hard choice, or you'd get some of what you wanted, but not everything. Or you'd get what you wanted, but you had to pay a price, or you had to suffer some harm as a result of it. Um, this led to stories that were uh, messy, complicated, that featured people kind of trying to make sense of how things had gone down. Um, and it, it felt really um, exciting to me. I felt like Apocalypse World lived in that seven to nine partial success range. Uh, and finally, the, the last thing that it did was it took its vision for what game mastering or MCing this game would be, and it iterated it as a set of agendas 
uh, and spilling out of those a set of principles for generally achieving those agendas and spilling out of those principles a set of moves for the MC to make. Um, so it, it was a way of saying like, hey, here are your goals. Here's how you work towards your goals. Here are the specific things you say moment to moment in order to work towards those goals. Um, for some people, when they read the MC principles and the MC agendas, it was nothing new. They were like, that's how I've always game mastered. But for other people, it was, it was a revelation. They were seeing a new kind of role playing uh, and a new possibility for what the GM and player relationship could look like. I really loved Apocalypse World, and I was really excited about playing it. Um, and so I tried to bring it to lots of different groups and lots of different tables. Uh, the primary place that I was running role playing games at the time was a weekly drop in that I helped uh, organize and facilitate called Terminal City Story Games, based out of Vancouver. And we would play roughly three hour sessions in a rotating set of coffee shops in East Vancouver. And it was, it was weekly, it was drop in. We worked really hard to make sure it was new player friendly. We were specifically um, reaching out to queer community. And so we had a lot of people coming in who had never played a role playing game before every single week. Um, and so we had about three hours to work with, but the first half hour would be you know, making sure people were settled, introducing one another, giving them a little pep talk, kind of you know, training them in some of the, the skills and perspectives that would, that would help them actually succeed at whatever game they were playing. Um, so really, we were looking at having a two and a half hour window to play a game. Apocalypse World didn't fit that format uh, for a lot of different reasons. So I've got here, this is one of the playbooks for the game, one of the character types that you can play. This one's the angel, um, who is kind of the healer, medic, maybe untrained therapist of the community. Um, and this is half of their character sheet. It was printed double-sided on letter paper and tri-folded. Uh, and then you would also have a double-sided letter page, tri-fold set of general rules for everyone. Um, this was too much for new players, uh, people who had never seen a role-playing game before. And it was too much to expect someone to internalize and do well with within a two and a half hour time frame. Um, these are uh, a list of things that are not uh, things that I think are bad about Apocalypse World. Uh, I think Apocalypse World is great. These are things that clashed with the context that we were trying to play in. Specifically, uh, sticking points that we found were the game uses a lot of acronyms. Um, I have learned that acronyms are the number one way to convince new players that they can't do whatever you're trying to get them to do. Uh, another big one was folding pages. Um, the fact that there were tr uh, three-fold double-sided pages meant that instead of having one dense block of information to scan, people had six, and they had to flip between them. And the flipping was really audible and really visible and embarrassing for people. Um, the game has uh, kind of an arcane and opaque way of presenting information sometimes. Uh, and for example, uh, in, in this game, you have six hit points. Um, but rather than saying you have six hit points and having kind of six check boxes, they say, okay, you've got a harm clock. And as you can see, the harm clock is divided into six segments. There's 12 to 3, 3 to 6, 6 to 9, and then each one after that is a one hour segment of the harm clock. Um, and now they're doing something cool here. What they're doing is they're, they're, they're replicating the kind of feel of growing up with the doomsday clock, you know, the one that counts down to nuclear annihilation, and you don't really care what the specific time is until you start approaching midnight. And then all of a sudden, every granular increment really, really matters, because you might die. So they're, they're, they're replicating that feeling in, in this mechanical, in this presentation, but to a new player, it's just confusing and hard. They don't get why it's not just six checkboxes. Um, another issue kind of related to this, it looks like there's a lot of math in this game. Apocalypse World is actually very easy. At most, you only ever add two single-digit numbers together at a time, or you know, you add dice plus one or two single-digit numbers. It, there's not a lot of math. But you wouldn't know that for looking at it. There's a lot of pluses, a lot of minuses. It words things like there, like there is jargon, and it presents things as jargon, even when it's actually just being used basically like natural language. You know, if, if it's like, you have a gun, it's one AP plus one harm plus messy plus loud. And what that means is just uh, 
it, when you fire it, it's not tidy. But like, rather than saying that in natural language, we kind of present it as jargon. That was really alienating to, to, to new players. We were playing in a coffee shop, and when you're in a coffee shop, it is customary and polite to go buy a coffee at some point. Um, uh, because there's only one or two baristas, not everyone can do that at the same time, which meant throughout the first half hour of play, a lot of the time we had people getting up and going and getting a brownie or a coffee or a tea. Um, and this caused a lot of friction with Apocalypse World specifically because in the setup there are a lot of setup steps which require the whole group to be in dialogue all at the same time and really focused at the same time, establishing history between characters, highlighting stats. And so we would often find that someone would go away, come back, and be like, what did I miss? And we'd be like, literally nothing. We couldn't move forward. Um, again, not an issue with Apocalypse World design, an issue with trying to implement it in this specific play context. Finally, Apocalypse World is designed for campaigns. That's great, but we were trying to play in two and a half hours in a cafe. So I took all of these concerns, and I also sat with what I loved about Apocalypse World, and I also thought about looking at the setting, what did I want to see more of, and what did I want to see less of? I wanted to see less gasoline bullets in Wasteland, and I wanted to see more queerness, relationships, and community. Now, Apocalypse World already had all those things. I just I was greedy, and I wanted more. Uh, so what I've got here is I've got one of the character sheets from the, the first, the prototype version of Dream Askew, which I released in 2013. Um, and things that you'll notice looking at it, it doesn't look like there's math. Um, there are fewer words. Uh, and in general, it was more approachable to a new player. Uh, character creation didn't involve making any mechanical choices. You didn't have to think about anything like stats. You just went down the left-hand column and you circled your choices. Um, some of the other things that I did with this design was I took the idea of MC principles and I turned them player facing so that everyone had their own set of principles. Um, and I really liked the idea of moves and I really liked the idea of that like seven to nine partial success and I wanted to figure out a way to replicate that without chance and without math. And so what the game does is it uses this token economy, so it works a little bit differently because you're, you're opting for when to, when to fail, when to get by with a middling success, and when to, when to shine. But basically the way it works is whenever you need inspiration or whenever people are looking at you expectantly, being like, what are you gonna say next? You can look at your moves, pick one, and kind of work that into your fiction. Um, uh, there, there's one move in regular moves called take action, leaving yourself vulnerable, and every character role had that, that same option. So if you weren't really looking at the moves, it didn't really matter all that much, because basically anything is taking action, leaving yourself vulnerable in the world. Uh, but when you, when you were stuck or when you were looking for the game to scaffold you and support you in telling a story, uh, it was there. Um, when you uh, do a weak move, you gain a token. In order to do a strong move, you spend a token. Um, and so that was the only math involved in the game. What it, what it did is it created this, this tempo to uh, characters where we would see them screw up or make bad choices or just be fallible. And then later on also got to see their redeeming strengths and why they were valuable and why they were kept around in their community. One of the other sticking points of the Apocalypse World at Terminal City Story Games is we really wanted games that felt uh, like you know, if someone had played it once, then the next time that they showed up, we could reliably hand them the book and be like, hey, do you want to run this this time? Um, you've already played it once. You know how it works. And we had a really high success rate with that, actually, because uh, these new players had never been told that running games was hard. Uh, and we just didn't tell them that, and then they all succeeded. Um, <laughs> but it wouldn't have worked with Apocalypse World. Apocalypse World does involve, like, a strong aesthetic vision. You, you do need to read the 300-page rule book. Um, and so what we did with Dream Askew, or what I did with Dream Askew, was I took the kind of the setting and all, all of the external threats that an MC would have to um, coordinate, and, we, and I split them into six different setting elements. And I've got here two examples of them. So everyone, in addition to playing a character, would also be controlling part of the setting. And they would toggle between those two roles in whatever may, way made sense, moment to moment. Um, in order to make that work, uh, you can see just below the title of each one, there, there's this uh, field saying directly tied to. Like the psychic maelstrom is directly tied to the iris and the torch. And the reason we wrote that was that if you're playing the iris or the torch, the iris being like a, uh, having access to strange psychic powers, the torch being kind of like a cult leader, 
Um, if, you, if you were one of those two characters, you shouldn't also play the psychic maelstrom. That'll create a lot of situations where you're basically just talking to yourself while everyone else watches. That's not good role-playing. Um, so we had this directly tied to thing. You just played something that was directly tied to someone else. So I released that game, the like 11 page prototype version of Dream Askew in 2013. And in 2014, I got an email by someone named Benjamin Rosenbaum who said, hey, I've been working for a while on this big intricate game about life in kind of a fabulous, fantastical version of uh, a Jewish shtetl. So set in the early 19th century in Eastern Europe. Um, and I'm excited about this big game, but I also was wondering if I could use the engine of Dream Askew to create kind of a, a smaller, faster version so I could get it out on people's tables sooner. And I said, like, yes, please, uh, you have my blessing. Um, and over the next couple of years, Benjamin kept on showing me the new iterations of his work. And I would kind of say, like, oh, this is cool. This seems too complicated. I like what you're doing here. Um, in 2017, early 2017, at a time when I was uh, considering revisiting Dream Askew and making it into a full book. This was a game that I was really proud of, that I thought had a lot of potential, but that wasn't getting the kind of play that my published games were. Uh, so it's like, maybe I should publish it. Maybe I should put more work into polishing it. Benjamin showed me his most recent version of Dream Apart, and there were a few things that he had added into the game which I found really inspiring. The first, on character sheets, was this thing called key relationships, and everyone would choose a few. Um, and and what this did was it, it made your character not kind of an isolated figure who is theoretically part of a community, um, but who basically is just about their own thing. Key relationships were really exciting, and they were immediately something that I wanted to bring into Dream Askew. And I think Benjamin, introducing this mechanic to me, pointed out to me how in Dream Askew, this game about queer community, queerness was mostly positioned as an aesthetic project. You would describe what you wore, you would describe um, your gender identity and things like this, but there was nothing about the, mat the material impact you had on the people around you, the relationships that you built, the ways in which you both belonged and didn't belong. Um, and so key relationships kind of showed a design path forward for my own game, and I ended up adopting them back into it. The other thing that Benjamin was doing mechanically that was really inspiring to me was that for all of the setting elements, he'd introduced this idea of pick up when and give away when. Um, and so you've, you've got your, your setting element, but sometimes players were like, well, when am I supposed to play my character? When am I supposed to play this other force in the world? And Benjamin made it really clear. It's like, this is specifically when you should be focusing on your setting element above and beyond all else. And then also this, mecha this mechanic of give away when, which we've recently changed to trade away when, um, which is like, this is when you will have a conflict of interest in playing your two roles, and you should just swap setting elements with someone else. That was uh, really exciting because it was a much, much more elegant system than having this logistical process where you're like, well, I want to play this, but I can't also play this. And if you're playing that, then that means you can't play this. So I guess I'll have to do this setting element, which I don't really want, because that's just how the, the bookkeeping works. Uh, this, this setting cues uh, mechanic allowed you to um, play whatever setting element you wanted, and potentially you'd have to just give it away right away. But that was okay because things were a lot more fluid. So I was really excited to take these mechanics and incorporate them into my ongoing development of Dream Askew. Um, and doing that development gave me a chance to also revisit some of the things that I'd seen were failing with Dream Askew or that were causing friction with the groups that I was playing with. Specifically, the way that I had designed character sheets, there was no clear text flow. In introducing the character, you kind of went along a top row, but then to do character creation, you went back to the, the left column and went downwards, and then you kind of just never read the middle column, you just skipped over it to start playing. Uh, and so that created some issues. First of all, I designed these principles, which I was really excited about, and like literally nobody would read them in full. The people, well, that's not true, because there were a few people who read them. <clears throat> and specifically, they came back with the complaint that a lot of it was too cerebral. They were saying things like, explore themes of compulsion and, and estrangement, which like is not useful. <laughs> <laughs> I may as well have said, make poignant art, right? Like, <laughs> Uh, finally, um, this isn't related to the others, but um, in the way I designed moves, I, I had a few moves separated out 
Um, they were called reactions. You could react by doing this or react by doing that. They didn't work differently than other moves because in my head I thought that would be useful to be like, hey, here's some more passive or reactive options for you. Um, it wasn't useful, it just created confusion, so I had a chance to cut them. So here is the redesigned character sheet. Um, one of the things that worked really well was that rather than calling something principles, I called them tips. Uh, anytime that someone was reading, uh, read the title principles, they were like, oh, here's a bunch of cerebral stuff that I technically don't need to read, I'm gonna skip that. But with tips, uh, that's like, oh, tips, they're useful, they're nice, they're light, I'll read them. Um, there was also only three, and they were all a single line each. Um, that was a huge thing. There was this, um, this kind of vaguely named special rules section, which had two mechanically dissimilar uh, things in it. You can see this in the, in the first uh, edition, one of which is kind of a prompt that if people interact with you in the way that makes you cool and exciting and useful, then they get a token. The other one was something totally unrelated. Um, so I cut the unrelated thing and I retitled from special rule to lure. So this is the way that you lure people into depending on you and into kind of seeking you out for support. Um, these made uh, tips and lures things that people actually read and engaged with. Um, in terms of the, the information flow, uh, there is now a column for introducing the character and then a column for creating and customizing the character and then a column for playing the character. Um, and that presentation meant that people would actually read all of the information and know where to look on the page to find it. Uh, Benjamin's pick up when and give away when uh, mechanics meant that I could get rid of a lot of the inelegant bookkeeping of uh, setting elements. I again um, retitled principles to tips because people like tips and they hate having to read about and internalize principles. Um, and in general, I cut down on the text. The final thing that I did in this, this new iteration was that I gave people a chance to customize their setting element, much like they customize their character. And so um, rather than just having a page full of like, you just have to internalize all this and remember to use it, there's now um, a chance to take a bit of ownership over the setting element. For example, the society intact, which is all the privileged people who still you know, have electricity and uh, capitalism and all those things, they haven't yet fallen out of society. Um, you, you get to decide, is this society intact um, a community that craves orthodoxy and ignorance of outsiders? Is this one that craves technological solutions for everything and profits? Um, so getting to have a little bit of customization over the elements of the setting gave people more buy-in when it came time to actually play those elements. Um, Benjamin's mechanics that were centered on defining relationships with other characters in the community reminded me that this is supposed to be a game about relationships and community. Um, and I really wanted community to be at the heart of this game. And the way to, I think, actualize that that I stumbled upon was having a community worksheet that was at the center of the table. Uh, to have the materials reflect the actual goals of the game. If I want a community at the center, I should put it at the center. So I took, I created this community worksheet for people to define the enclave, their queer enclave. So you would circle post-apocalyptic visuals as well as uh, kind of a trifecta of things that were in conflict amongst the people of your community. Um, and so potentially you would have kind of overgrowth and swamps and people building like uh, not very sanitary outdoor kitchens and there's a pile of trash everywhere but raging parties amidst all these swamps all the time. And people were struggling, you know, trying to, to balance the needs of mutants and those who had a need for purity and all of that was conflicting with people just being excited about celebrating the limitless possibilities of queer sex. Uh, so different things like that uh, could come up. And, and this Enclave worksheet ended up producing really different communities in every iteration of play. Um, so I took this back to Benjamin and I said, like, this is where I'm excited about moving the game. Does this, does this work with your vision? Um, and he was like, I love the idea of this worksheet, but picking out visuals for the shtetl doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, this is a historical game. It's like a really specific historical context. The visuals are more or less set. We already know what they are. And um, the, like, the conflicts within the community over ideological concerns are already incorporated in a lot of the character roles that I've designed. So we worked together to, to imagine what, what does a community worksheet that meaningfully adds to play look like for Dream Apart? 
And uh, Benjamin came up with this system, which involves circling blessings and curses for your shtetl. Uh, so it was at this point that we had realized that we were really co-developing these games alongside each other. Um, and so I pitched the idea that maybe we could just um, develop them together and publish them together as a single split book. Um, and this is the time that we started kind of talking towards like the realization of these as a, as a product. There is this design idea that I was first introduced to by Mark Rosewater over on the Making Magic blog, that once you have any two points, you have a line. Uh, and so having these two different games meant that we could more fully see what it was that our individual games were attempting to do and what it was that they were also succeeding in doing by positioning the two of them in dialogue with one another. There was a lot mechanically that they shared. For example, they had this diceless token economy, a shared and distributed narrative authority without a game master. They each had six character roles and six setting elements and the custom community worksheet. But there was also a lot of places where the two games diverged mechanically. Dream Apart has rules for falling in love. Dream Askew does not. Dream Apart has an extensive glossary. This is something that Benjamin felt was really important for enabling people to play games that in the shtetl. Um, and, I, and I agree, having played Dream Apart uh, without this glossary, uh, I'm not myself Jewish, without this glossary, I would have been so lost uh, and starting to play. This is really great. But this is also something that I really specifically did not want in Dream Askew. When people encountered different queer terminology and different uh, terminology about different ways of configuring society, I wanted it to be murky and alien and uncertain and up for contested definition because in my opinion, that is part of what it means to be in queer community and part of what it means to uh, work with queer language. It means an, uh, an elusiveness towards definition. So Benjamin's game includes a glossary, mine doesn't. In terms of the thematics of the game, both featured an independent marginalized community which faced an uncertain relationship with the dominant culture, kind of like a culture that could, if it wanted to at any time, just crush them unilaterally. Um, both took a real world community that we had a personal lived connection with and looked at it through a fantastic or fabulous lens. And finally, both were optimistic, but not in a way that was naive about the hardships faced by these people. Um, so we, we kind of had this hope amidst hardship. That said, again, with the thematics, there was a bunch of places where the two of us deviated from the established line. One was speculative fiction. Uh, about the future, one was historical fiction about the past, um, and there was a number of other smaller thematic places where we, where we really diverged from one another. But having that uh, established line, knowing what our games were individually and relationally better by having co-developed them, that gave us a lot more confidence in making those choices to deviate from that line. Um, knowing that line meant that we could, we could better articulate what was special about these games to people. Um, and what these games as a category were like. Um, we, um, and because we, we'd, we'd had these conversations where we teased out what was going on beneath the specific choices we were making, we were then able to, in, in writing the game, in writing the book, not just write Dream Askew and Dream Apart side by side, but also another chapter about designing your own game of this sort, building upon this engine, designing with and working with these themes, and in writing that final chapter of the book, towards, you know, towards the end of all of the writing and all of the development of the project, I introduced this, 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 these, this phrase, belonging outside belonging, to kind of describe the formula for how to go about setting up this kind of situation. You needed a community and, and characters to be experiencing a sort of belongingness within that community, but it needed to exist outside of a dominant culture and power structure and access to resources. Um, but once uh, late in the game, we'd written out the phrase belonging outside belonging, we kind of looked at it and seized upon it and said like, yes, this is the, the line. This, these, the games that we were working with are games of belonging outside belonging. Any future games that build upon this engine are games of belonging outside belonging. Like this is our identity, this is our brand, this is our line, this is our engine. We also came up with a description of what's going on mechanically with these games as no, no dice, no masters, which is a playoff of the anarchist, no gods, no masters. Uh, this is my most clever piece of writing, those four words. I'm very <laughs> proud of them. Um, so just to end off, I want to talk just generally for a few minutes about 
the idea of designing relationally. Um, now, I am an independent tabletop designer, which means I do a lot of designing kind of in my own silo in my bedroom with my computer or with my notebook or with index cards that I eventually lose. Um, I know that video game designers often have the luxury of working on teams, which is really exciting. But I think that the kind of design that me and, Benj me and Benjamin did was, was different than working on a team. We were both working on our own independent project, and we would bring these two projects together and kind of temper them against one another. And that was really exciting. Um, when Vincent and McGay released uh, Apocalypse World, they were really open-hearted about encouraging people to say, like, please come in, use this engine, like, modify the game, make your own games out of it. Um, and so many people did. They, they introduced this idea that a game could be powered by the apocalypse, which was their way of kind of opening up the, the engine of the game for other people to use in their creative projects. Um, and in the way that I talked about design trends prior to Apocalypse World, I had that one slide over, over purple. The design trends since Apocalypse World, the most pervasive one is people have just been designing games that are powered by the apocalypse, for better and for worse. Um, and there's lots of other amazing projects going on as well, but um, just a giant amount of Powered by the Apocalypse games have been coming out. And I think in part it's because there's a, a community and an excitement and again, the Baker's kind of openness and encouragement of that kind of project. Um, Dream Askew had a different process than any other Powered by the Apocalypse uh, games as far as I know. The other ones kind of took all of the genre trappings and uh, specific content and stripped it out of the engine and then kind of applied their own genre and tweaked the engine to, to suit. What Dream Askew did was it um, kind of took a more of a, uh, a child role to the parent of Apocalypse World, and it said, like, I'm going to sit with and adapt and make my own all the parts of the mechanics and all of the parts of the, the fiction. And so some things just really held through. Apocalypse World has this idea of a psychic maelstrom that is now raging just outside of our perception at all times. Um, and Dream Askew just still has that. It hasn't really changed. Um, but the, the moves with the seven to nine results that slowly iterated into its own things with this diceless token economy. And so in different, in different ways, uh, Dream Askew kind of just started from the place of being like, Apocalypse World is great. How do I make it more my thing? And it has kept doing that across years until it became what I would consider like its, 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 its own game and its own engine. Um, Dream Askew started from a place of being more of a, a child to, uh, or Dream Apart started as being a game that was more of a child to Dream Askew. But over time, when ben, as Benjamin brought me things and I became excited about them, the relationship between those two games changed and it became one of partnership. And I worked through my kind of uh, trust issues and allowed myself to say like, okay, like Benjamin's coming in with really cool ideas and I want to let them change my game and I want to let them challenge my vision and I want to be open to the idea that Benjamin sees things in this engine and in this design that I don't. Um, and for us, that was really powerful. I think there are a few things that kept our trust high in this kind of co-development back and forth process and that was that we had a lot of similar aesthetic vision and a lot of similar ethical vision for what we wanted these games to look like and what we wanted this fiction to represent. Um, and so that's, that's my talk. Thank you so much. Hi. Thanks so much. Um, so I think we have some time for questions. Yes. Uh, So a lot of the character customization on your in your game has these finite choices. Do you allow players to invent their own choices for those categories? Um, okay, so there's a lot of finite lists in character creation, and do I allow uh, players to author in their their own ideas? Um, the way that I explain the game is no. Um, the way that people play the game is really varied. Uh, my experience in, in designing role-playing games is that if you know your game can handle three to seven players, then on the back of the book you state that it's for three to six players because people will always break that guideline and they'll always try to cram one extra person in. And similarly, I think the, the game holds up 
to a lot of experimentation and, okay, but what if I did this that I'm not expecting? Um, but but I, I work to keep my designs kind of in a, a structured, easy to explain, self-contained space so that when people approach them and start doing all these wild different things, it can still hold up without buckling. Um, okay, so what does the dialogue and process look like to, to allow games to be community owned? Um, I feel like I'm still learning to let go of most of my possessiveness over what I write. Um, but I have realized that when I can get over myself and get over my ego in that way, that I, I stand to benefit as well as other designers. Um, I think there's like a, sometimes people can get stuck in a false scarcity model, especially if uh, doing games is just what you do full time. I uh, sell games about gay teenagers, uh, and that's my family's sole income and has been for a while. And it can be scary to be in that that, that space. Uh, it can make me feel really possessive. But with the quiet year, especially, a lot of different people have approached me saying like, I want to design something that's based on the quiet year, and some of them are like. It's just like the quiet year with some gentle reskinning, and others of them kind of tear the whole thing apart and take some of the ideas and run in wild new directions that I would have never thought of. Um, but in all of the cases, when I have been like, okay, well, you could work out licensing under these terms, and maybe you could pay me this percentage of royalties and blah blah blah, I've just felt kind of gross about it afterwards, um, and it hasn't been profitable for me. And any time that I have been like. Of course, you have my blessing. Show me what you work on. I'm so excited. That sounds amazing. I, w I do want to point out this potential pitfall that I see in your description. People have gone on to um, do really cool things with it, and those have gone on to be really positive relationships. Um, people have then seen me at conventions and been really excited to be like, can I take you out for lunch? People have been excited to support my Kickstarters and retweet stuff. Uh, people have included links to my game in their game. Um, and so I think just learning to trust people is, uh, has been a slow process for me, but has been like really rewarding and I think has made my own exposure uh, for my games and my place in the community and my sense of solidarity among designers greater. And it has just been worthwhile on those terms. Yeah, um, that was actually a thing that I, I didn't mention as explicitly about the community worksheets, but both the Dream Askew and Dream Apart community worksheet, most of it is blank space because the intent is that you would draw a map. Um, and that's also something that's in Apocalypse World. One of the principles is just draw maps like crazy. Just like any time that there could be a map of something, there should be. Um, and you should just have piles of maps, just like here's the interior of this caravan, here's this community center. Um, uh, but I feel like um, when we're talking about games that are, especially games that are fiction first, um, having reference and support and scaffolding for people's imaginations is really helpful so that we're not all in our own little brain silos, imagining different things that may or may not be compatible with one another, being able to like put something in front of us and say like, yes, this is what we're doing, is, is really great. Um, and so, I don't know, I think that, I think that maps um, are exciting. And anytime that you have design which has people kind of like all pooling to hover over something and kind of reaching over and pointing at it and touching at it a lot, um, that creates excitement for the game. Um, a thing that I've been thinking a lot more about in my design work generally is the way that the physicality of games um, uh, has a huge impact in the stories that get told within them. Um, and uh, one of the um, design disciplines that I've been really excited about over the last few years, this is a bit of a tangent, I hope that's okay, but one of the, the design disciplines that I've been really excited about over the last few years is permaculture, which is primarily about agricultural design that is uh, 
uh, self-sustaining that responds to the environment that contributes to and restores the environment around it. And one of the ideas that they have that I've since stolen for game design is this idea of zones of use. That as you're designing your farm or whatever else you might be designing, uh, if you're not a farmer, um, what you should put at the center of the design is the things that you're going to touch most often. And what you should start your design with is the things that you're gonna to touch most often. And then out to zone, zone one and zone three and eventually zone four, which is the things that you only need to, you know, touch or harvest a couple times a year, and eventually zone five, which is the wilderness, which is your teacher and you're supposed to learn from it, and you're supposed to incorporate its patterns into your design. And so there's this kind of idea in permaculture of starting with the things you touch the most and the things that you never touch and only learn from, and kind of radiating outwards to meet that wilderness. And so when I designed Dream Askew, I was, or when I redesigned Dream Askew, I was really excited about incorporating these ideas into how I was designing it. And so one of the things I did is that the very last step of our development process was starting to write the rule book. Um, the entire time that we were developing and iterating, we exclusively did so with the things that players had on the table at all times. Um, and we needed those to be as self-evident as possible. We had like a little one-page rule summary kind of thing that we would send along, but we really needed all the materials to speak for themselves, to be self-evident. And uh, like I said earlier, like I want a community to be at the center of the game, so the way that you, you do that in a permaculture way, I think, is that you put a community at the center of the game, physically. And so that's, that's where the maps came from. Turning on time, I think we, are, we, have, a, we have a long lunch break. Okay. This, this session does go about 30. Just so about 30, okay. But the, at least um, five minutes. Then we also have close to problems that we're seeing. Yeah, from 12.30 to 1. Oh, from 12.30 to 1. Okay, super. In that case, does anybody have uh, any other questions for David? Yeah, right here. Um, so, um, I really like the games. Uh, we played them a lot. Um, and like you were saying, the physicality of the game is really important. Um, but what happened was we graduated college, and now we're all separate. No. <laughs> um, uh, the strategies that I have taken are any time that someone says, I'd like to develop a web tool for this game, I have said, yes, you have my blessing. Please let me know what you need to make that happen. And those tools often get used. Um, I know that um, friends at the table have played both The Quiet Year and Dream Askew. They recently did Dream Askew for their Patreon backer only. Um, thing and I, I watched that stream and they did a lot of interesting things in terms of uh, how they navigated kind of a shared map in MS Paint maybe um, and so looking to what people who actually play online regularly do is probably a good idea. I don't personally play online. Uh, I find that my attention span uh, is really low for that kind of play and almost immediately I am tuning people out to refresh Twitter uh, so I just don't waste their time by being a bad player in online spaces. Um, and I just play locally. So I don't know, and if you develop web tools, that's amazing. And if you want to develop some for my games, I would be very appreciative. Any more questions? Yeah, one over here. So I must play nice people's part of the development process. Um, for the prototype, very little. Um, uh, and then over time, I feel like a lot of the playtesting that I did was when I had specific concerns, and a lot of them were pr about presentation and aesthetics, not mechanics, um, that I would be playtesting those specific components. So I would be having a friend over for lunch, and I'd be like, hey, I'm almost done. Sorry, just give me a few more minutes to finish this up. Also, can you please create a character? Here you go. Um, and I would just try and hand them a character sheet and see if they would correctly do it and create something that they were excited about, and then it would like, go off into the kitchen to finish frying things. Um, so I do a lot of that kind of playtesting, where I would try and where I would try and kind of throw things at people and see if they could intuitively make sense of them and engage with them, um, without me being there as a facilitator or conductor. Um, that that was more. There, the mechanics of this game are are very fluid and responsive, um, and so there's no there's not really any math to test. Um, so a lot of it was testing um, kind of different flows of information, different presentation, 
Um, the creative load of, of, of playing Dream Askew is all about being asked to make some kind of high order, like cerebral decisions about community and uh, world building, um, and to be, at, to be making them quickly in dialogue with one another. So needing to test the moment-to-moment uh, -moment scene mechanics was, was less important for this game than testing kind of, does this feel accessible and engaging and non-intimidating to players in the setup process especially? So that was the stuff I play tested most. Do we have time for one more question? Oh yeah, way over there. Yeah, um, Dream Askew still runs, I think, in a three to four hour time span. Um, my goal was to have it run shorter. And um, just like everyone, my, my skills and craft are continuing to evolve. And I don't think that is a goal that I hit as solidly as I had wanted to. It does play in around three hours, though. Um, a big part of that was looking at what is complex about the game, what is the creatively demanding stuff and the procedurally demanding stuff that I care about and that I want to preserve. And then looking at everything else and saying, how can I make this as simple and pared down and streamlined as possible so that the things that people are, the meat that people are engaging with is the meat that I am wanting them to engage with. So looking to really pare down anything that wasn't kind of focal to the vision. Um, but I think there's other designers who do much better work at creating um, fast, accessible games with quick time, time play. Uh, Jason Morningstar is a really good example. I think that's the time we've gotten, so a big round of applause for Andrew. <laughs>